to my fellow Dream Low Southern Thinkers. It's the LOP News Podcast. My name is Craig Trans, many from the Business Squad, the Major South Florida. And today's date is Monday, June 17th, 2019. So let us begin. Ooh, hello, folks. Thanks for tuning in. <coughs> yeah, it's nice and rainy out in the heart of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I'm at uh, Stash, located at 109 Southwest 2nd Avenue in the Hemshire District of the same city. A chance it with Revolution Live and America's Backyard. It's funny, I did a podcast yesterday and uh, made some reference to the Sun Sentinel editorial board. They're desperate on petitioning on the assault weapons or semi-auto ban about the constitutional amendment. It only had 103,000 signatures. And I guess what happened was some of the folks on Bit Shoot and uh, one person with Pocket Neck, I hear Harley Kirk was, I put the picture of a, of a, a semi-auto ban as a picture with the with the cross, with the, the face in it. It said, ban assault weapons now. So they assume I'm for this. So they haven't really listened to the damn episode. And that is disappointing because something like that, assuming, will make an ass out of you and me. If you play that game in front of a judge or exhibit that style, they're not going to be pleased. And, you know, I may have probably should have put something different on there too. But the ones that know me for a long time understand where I'm coming from when it comes to natural born rights. I've been very consistent. So I'm not angry with these individuals, but it's disappointing. So I'm about to throw an old episode in the comments to hey, you listen to this, then listen to the latest episode. Then you make then you give me your viewpoints before attacking it on face value. Because one other thing too, people, individuals like that, possibly they get they sign a contract, don't read the fine print. Something to think about. So always observe responsibly. Now I'm not angry or anything like that. So with all due respect, but we've all remember we've all been bamboozled or put our foot in our mouths and once in our in, in, in our lives, and you don't want to make that a habit. We, have, we all have those certain uh, flaws, but I don't want to make that one of them because we'd be stepping on your own bear trap. But truth of the matter is, I gotta say, you know, hey, just listen to it, check it out in its entirety. Because I even have article, I have an, I put, I put that editorial article in there and Daisy Luther footnotes about gun control and, or um, mass shootings. So if you see them both, and her my intake, then you understand. That's for mainly the first time listeners. No, but that is like have to take that off my chest. But I'm not losing sleep over. I got like four thumbs down on bit shoot. I'm like, okay, they haven't really heard the show. <laughs> well they are for victim disarmament or wanna bring back prohibition, revisit it, yeah, from the eighteenth Amendment. So this is all I'm gonna be doing. Instead of all that, I'm going to be doing a couple on Consortium News. And this is interesting. This one came out today, to be exact. It's by Ray McGovern. And this one's entitled, FBI Never Saw CrowdStrike Unredacted or Final Report on Alleged Russian Hacking Because None Was Produced. So all you Trump payers out there should actually listen to this. So... Send it to send it to those anti Trumpsters out there as well, folks. You know me, I'm not a Trump worshiper, but you got folks out there if he if he farts, they'll they'll spaz out and scream bloody Mary. You know, this whole that's how dramatic the, the, all these individuals are get caught in the mind control propaganda machine. But this is what he has to say. FBI relied on CrowdStrike's conclusion to blame Russia for hacking and DNC servers through the private firm never produced a final report and and the FBI never asked them to as Ray McGovern explains. And as it says here, CrowdStrike, the controversial cybersecurity firm that the Democratic National Committee 
chose over the FBI in 2016 to examine this compromised computer servers never produce an unredacted or final forensic report for the government because the FBI never required it. The Justice Department has admitted. The revelation came in a court filing by the government in the pretrial phase of Roger Stone, a longtime Republican operative who had an official unroll, an unofficial role in the campaign candidate of Donald of candidate Donald Trump. Stone has been charged with misleading Congress, obstructing justice, and imitating Im- intimidating a witness. Let's let you folks know too. He actually Roger Stone did uh did rally with um Scott Sheriff Scott is uh, Sheriff Scott Israel from Broward County. So let's uh, let you folks know he's a hustler. But I will continue on here. The filing was in response to a motion by Stones' lawyer asking for unredacted reports from CrowdStrike in an effort to get the government to prove that Russia hacked the DNC server. The government does not possess the information that defendant seeks, the filing says. In his motion, Stone's lawyer said he, he had only been given three redacted drafts. In the startling footnote in the government's response, the DOG admit the drafts are all that exist, although the reports produced to the, def- to the defendant are marked draft. Counsel for the DNC and the DCCC informed the government that they are the last version of the report produced. The footnotes say, says, in other words, cross-strike upon which the FBI relied to conclude that Russia hacked the DNC, never completed a final report and only returned over their three redacted drafts to the government. These drafts were voluntarily given to the FBI by DNC lawyers the filing says no redacted information concerned the attribution of the attack to Russian actors. The filing quotes DNC lawyers as saying, In Stone's motion, his lawyers argued if the Russian state did not hack the DNC, DCCC, or Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta servers, then Roger Stone was prosecuted for obstructing a congressional investigation into an unproven Russian state hacking conspiracy. The issue of whether or not the DNC was hacked is central to the defendant's defense. The DOJ's responded, the the government does not need to prove at the defendant's trial that the Russians hacked the DNC in order to prove the defendant made false statements, tampered with the witness, and obstructed justice into congressional investigation regarding election interference. Thousands of emails from the DNC server were published by WikiLeaks in July 2016, revealing that the DNC interfered in a Democratic primary process to favor former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton over Senator Bernie Sanders for the party's presidential nomination. The 12 indicted 12 uh, the U.S. indicted 12 mil- Russian military. 12 Russian military intelligence agents in 2018 for allegedly hacking the DNC server and giving the emails to WikiLeaks. Comey can't say why. At a time of high tension in the 2016 presidential campaign when the late Senator John McCain and others were calling Russian hacking an act of war, the FBI settled for three redacted draft reports from CrowdStrike rather than investigate the alleged hacking itself, the court documents show. Then the FBI director, James Comey, admitted in congressional testimony that he chose not to take control of the DNC's hacked computers and did not dispatch FBI computer experts to inspect them, but has had trouble explaining why. In his testimony, he conceded that best practices would have dictated that forensic experts gain physical access to the computers. Nevertheless, the FBI decided to rely on forensics performed by a firm being paid for by the DNC. Suspicions grew as Comey started referring to CrowdStrike as the pros that they hire. No doubt became more intense when he referred to CrowdStrike as a high-class entity. In fact, the company has a tarnished reputation for reliability and objectivity well before it was hired by the DNC. I'm sorry. That's what happens when people assume. Uh, it's like an entrapment game here. So I'm going to continue on here. Dmitry L. Porovi, Porovich, excuse me, a, a crowd striker, a crowd strike co founder, is an opponent of Russian President Vladimir Putin and a senior fellow at the anti Russian 
Atlanta Council think tank in Washington. CrowdStrike said it determined that Russia had hacked the DNC survey because it found Kyrillic letters in the metadata, as well as the name of the first Soviet intelligence chief, clues an amateur might leave. But the software CrowdStrike used to blame Russia for hacking the DNC server was later revealed to be faulty. It had to be rewritten. CrowdStrike's early role in the memorandum for the president on July, 20, uh, July 24, 2017, veteran intelligence professionals for Sandy referred promptly to this instructive time sequence. June 12, 2016, Julian Assange announces WikiLeaks is about to publish emails related to Hillary Clinton. June 14, 2016, DNC contractor CrowdStrike, with a dubious professional record and multiple conflicts of interest, announces that malware has been found on the DNC server and claims there is evidence it was injected by Russians. June 15, 2016, Guccifer 2.0 affirms the DNC statement claims responsibility for the hack, claims to be a WikiLeaks source, and posts documents that the forensic show was synthetically tainted with Russian fingerprints. VIPS does not believe the June 12, 14, and 15 timing was pure coincidence. Rather, it suggests the start of a preemptive move to associate Russia with anything WikiLeaks might have been about to publish at the show that it came from a Russian hack. Bill Biney, Benny, a former NSA technical director and a member of VIPS member, filed an affidavit in Stones' case. Biney said WikiLeaks did not receive stolen data from the Russian government. Intrinsic metadata in the publicly available files on WikiLeaks demonstrates that the files acquired by WikiLeaks were delivered in a medium such as a thumb drive, preferring CrowdStrike explaining to Congress. Why did FBI Director James Comey not simply insist on access to the DNC computers? Surely he could give, he could have, he could have gotten the appropriate authorization. In early January 2017, reacting to media reports that the FBI never asked for access, Comey told the Senate Intelligence Committee there were multiple requests at different levels for access to the DNC servers. Ultimately, what has agreed to is the private company will share with us that they uh, what the, us what they saw he said Comey described CrowdStrike as a highly respected cybersecurity company asked by committee chairman Richard Burr Republican of North Carolina rather direct access to the servers and devices who have helped the FBI in their investigation Comey said it would have our forensic folks would always prefer to get access to the original device or server that's involved so it's the best evidence he said all right so five months later after comey had been fired burr gave him a mulligan in the form of few kid gloves clearly well rehearsed questions burr said this and the end the fbi in this case unlike the other cases that you might investigate did you ever have access to the actual hardware that was hacked or did you have to rely on a third party to provide you the data that they had collected in Comey's response. In the case of the DNC, we, we did not have access to the devices themselves. We got relevant forensic information from a private party, a high class entity that have done the work, but we didn't get direct access. So Burr made a statement, but no content. Comey responded, yes, correct. So Burr made this statement here. Isn't content an important part of forensic of the forensics from a counterintelligence standpoint? As a Comey's response, it is all though that it what was briefed to me by my folks, the people who were my folks at the time, is that they had gotten the information from the private party that they needed to understand the intrusion by the spring of twenty sixteen. More telling was um, earlier questioning by House Intelligence Committee member William, I mean, Will Hurd, Republican from Texas, who had been a CIA officer for a decade. On March 20th, 2017, he was still FBI director. Comey evidenced some considerable discomfort as he tried to explain to the committee why the FBI did not insist on getting physical access to the DNC computer and to his own forensics. This is what Hurd has to say. So there was about a year between FBI's first notification of some potential problems with the DNC network and then that information getting on, get on WikiLeaks. Comey says, yes, sir. So Heard says this. When did the DNC provide access for? T 
to the FBI for your technical folks to review what happened. Comey's response? Well, we never got direct access to the machines themselves. The DNC in the spring of 2016 hired a firm that ultimately shared with us their forensics from the review of the system. <laughs> Secondhand information, yeah. All right. So we'll just keep on going here. So her, so her goes, so director, director FBI notified the DNC early before any information was put on the WikiLeaks and when you, when you have still been, never been given access to any of the technical or physical machines that were, that were hacked by the Russians. So Comey's response is, that's correct. Although we got the forensics from the pros that they hired, which, again, best practice is always to get access to the machines themselves. But this, my folks tell me, was an appropriate substitute. <laughs> So I'm going to continue on here. Comey spikes deal with Assad. Director Comey's March, 20, uh, March 20th, 2017 testimony to the House Intelligence Committee came at the same time he was sculling months long, sculling months long negotiations between Assad and lawyers representing the DOJ and CIA to grant some limited immunity for the WikiLeaks founder. In return, Assad offered to one redact some classified CIA information he might release in the future and two provide technical evidence and discussion regarding who did not engage in the DNC's releases. Investigative journalist John Sol Solomon quoting WikiLeaks intermediary with the government wrote this story based on interviews and trove of internal DOJ documents turned over to the Senate investigators. It would be a safe assumption that Assange was offering to prove that Russia was not WikiLeaks. Source of DNC email, something Assange has repeatedly said. That, of course, would have been the last thing Comey would have, would have wanted. On March 31st, 2017, WikiLeaks released the most damaging disclosure up to the point from what it called Vault 7, a treasure trove of CIA cyber tools leaked from the CIA files. This disclosure featured the tools to a marble framework which enabled the CIA to hack into computers disguised who hacked in and falsely attribute the hack to someone else by leaving the so-called telltale signs, like acrylic for an example. The CIA documents also show that marble tool had been employed in 2016. Two weeks later, then CIA director Mike Pompeo branded WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence service and the, and the U.S. put pressure on Ecuador, which had given Assange asylum to expel him from his London embassy. He was on April 11th when British police arrested him. On the same day, he was convicted of skipping bail on a Swedish investigation that had, been, that had since been dropped. Assange was sentenced to 50 weeks in London's max security prison, Belmarsh, um, Bel security Belmarsh Prison. Comey it seemed a safe bet. Still worried that Assad or one of his associates will provide technical evidence enough to prove who did not engage in the DNC's releases. What were they thinking? At the March 20th, 2017 House Intelligence Committee hearing, Congressman Terry Gowdy heaped effusive praise then on FBI Director Comey, calling him incredibly respected. At the early stage, no doubt, Gowdy meant no double and try to, he might now, as Russian gate trans, transmogryphies in deep state gate, the DOJ is launching a probe into the origins of the Russia gate and the intelligence agency's alleged role in it. It remains to be whether the U.S. attorney for, um, for the District of Connecticut, John Durham, who is a leading probe, will interview Assange unlike special counsel Robert Mueller, who did not. It is proving very difficult for some of my old FBI friends and others to believe that Comey and other justice, intelligence, and security officials at the very top could have played fast and loose with the Constitution and the law and lived a lie over the past few years. How did, how did they ever think they could get away with it, they asked. The answer is deceivingly simple. Comey himself has explained it in a moment of seemingly unintentional candor in his pretentious book, A Higher Loyalty, he wrote. 
I was making decisions in an environment where Hillary Clinton was sure to be the next president. <laughs> I think this is great, folks. I'm going to continue on here. There would be no problem, of course, if Hillary Clinton had won the, uh, the election. That's why... That's what they all thought, and that probably explains their lack of care in keeping their activities off written record and out of computers. Elementary tradecraft goes out the window with these upper echelon, high-class entity officials. When they are sure that she and they are going to be the viable winners with promotions, not indictments, in store for them. And, of course, George L Joe Luria had a um, background reading on Deep State Gate, and there's plenty of links on here. You should check it out yourselves, folks. And it's very good, and I always um, support these guys. Um, I have, um, always enjoy uh, sharing their stuff. Well, here's the thing, folks. <laughs> it's going to be an interesting case for Roger Stone if he don't get, if, if he don't get what they want. Okay. That's his attorney to be exact. I'm laughing at it, all right? Even with the charges on Roger Stone was so meek and unmeritable. I just <laughs> I just bust out laughing. And, of course, they made a big stink. They did a big raid on his guy for peanuts, okay? Which is all peanuts. And I'm still disappointed because I never got a response from... Um, Sheriff Tony on why he never, they never, um, he never, he, he let them, he never, um, if the FBI ever informed him they're going to arrest him or not. Because some people claim, some of these experts or lawyers may claim, oh, they don't do that. Yes, they do. Okay? They do have that power. Sheriff does that. They, they have to notify the sheriff as part of the 10th Amendment obligation. So I'm not making any judgment towards Sheriff Tony. I'm gonna have to check my emails too, just to uh, verify that. If not, you know, like I said, I'll be I'll be disappointed if I don't, I don't receive it. Because this is important. Because we don't need another federal yes man. We need a constitutional sheriff. I know he's just um, he inherited a big mess. I'm not gonna argue about that at all. But it's good to know these things. I'm gonna have to go to a, one of his meetings and just have a little word, a little chit chat. Hey, I'm not saying he's a bad person. He achieved a lot. Interesting bio, interesting story about his life in Philadelphia. But the whole thing is this: there's a lot of there's a lot of garbage going on with this with this uh, Roger Stone case and Julian Assange being being trying to get him extradited because they want to cover things up. They are very anti-war of the anti-freedom of the press. Comey and these uh, other lackeys out there. Uh, one thing I know for sure. It should, they should be, these individuals should have there should be enough evidence stating that he can be arrested him and his associates can be arrested for RICO or give him espionage as well a taste of their own medicine see how they react to it so yes that's why I do support hey free Roger Stone and free Julian Assange like them or not it doesn't matter because who any of us could be next this is why we gotta really focus on these areas. All right, so next one here, my friends, came from Consortium News once again, and this is here: "Danger of Leaving a President Out of the Loop." This came out yesterday. It's by Kathleen Johnston, and she has a website that you can read for yourself. And of course, here Donald Trump was kept in the dark after by a possible U.S. nuclear response for a Russian cyber weapon attack. The U.S. has now ramped up offensive cyber warfare against Russia's power grid, putting Trump in a ta deep bind, says Kathleen Johnston. Johnstone. The New York Times has published an anonymously sourced report titled U.S. Escalates Online Attacks on Russian power Russia's Power Grid about the placement of potentially crypto malware inside a Russian system in the, at the desk with an aggressiveness that had never been trade, tried before, which could potentially plunge Russia into darkness or cripple its military. With one anonymous official reporting that we are doing things at a scale that we never contemplated a few years ago. Obviously, yet this is another is yet another serious escalation in the continually mounting series of steps. 
that have been taken into a new Cold War between the planet's two nuclear superpowers. Had a report been leaked to Russian media from anonymous criminal officials that Moscow was escalating its cyber aggressions against the American energy grid, this would doubtless be labeled an act of war by the political media class of the U.S. and its allies with demand for immediate retaliation. Put this in, in, in their perspective, New York Times reported last year that the Pentagon was pushing for a U.S. nuclear posture review to include the strategy of retaliating against serious Russian cyber attacks on America's power grid with nuclear weapons. So that's, that's, so that's scary enough. What's even scarier is the information that the Times buried way down in the 21st and 23rd paragraphs of its report. Two Ministry of Officials said believe Mr. Trump had not been briefed in any detail about the steps to place implants, software codes that can be used for surveillance or attack inside the Russian grid. The Pentagon and the intelligence officials described broad hesitation to go into detail with Mr. Trump about operations against Russia for concerns over his reaction and the possibility that he might countermand it for, or discuss with foreign officials as he did in 2017 where he mentioned a sensitive operation in Syria to the Russian foreign minister. Because of the new law defines the actions in cyberspace as acting to traditional military activity on the ground, in the air, or at sea, no such briefing would be necessary, they added. In the article title, Pentagon Keeps Trump in the Dark About His Cyber Attacks on Russia, Rolling Stone's uh, Peter Wade described this jarring revelation as follows. New laws enacted by Congress last year allow such callous and military activity in cyberspace to go ahead without the president's approval. So in this case, the, those new laws are protecting American interests by keeping the sitting president out of the loop. What a scary time to be alive. Yeah, so it's taking his, uh, taking away his right as commander in chief. All right, so let's continue on here. So Trump is in a bit of a bind now. The escalation has already been put in place, which will likely be an equal response from Moscow if it isn't scaled back. But scaling it back would mean a whole new wave of shirk, shirk, shirking alarmism from the political media about the conspiracy theory that won't just die no matter how much evidence is mounted against it. That Trump is a control puppet of the Kremlin. All he is working to build the case for re-election in 2020. We have been warned. Stephen F. Cohen, professor emeritus of Russian studies at New York University and Princeton University, one of the America's leading experts on U.S.-Russian relations, have been warning for years that exactly that would happen. In uh, April 2017, interview on the Democracy Now! Cohen warned that placing political pressure on the, on the U.S. president to never step back from escalations during a shutdown, showdown between two nuclear superpowers could have potentially war end, world ending consequences should mounting tensions see a situation similar to the Cuban Missile Crisis again. I think it is the most dangerous mo moment in the American Russian relations, at least since the Cuban Missile Crisis, Cohen said, and arguably it's more dangerous because it's more complex. Therefore, we, then, we and then, meanwhile, we have in Washington leaves and, in my judgment, factless accusations that Trump has somehow been compromised by the Kremlin. So, at this worst moment in American-Russian relations, we have an American president who's being politically crippled by the worst imaginable is unprecedented. Let's stop and think. No president has ever been accused essentially of treason. This is what we're talking about here, or, or that his associates have committed treason. Imagine, for example, John Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, Cohen said, imagine if Kennedy had been accused of being a secret Soviet Kremlin agent and would have been, been crippled in the only way he could prove he wasn't it was to have a launch war against the Soviet Union. At the time, the option was nuclear war. And as you can watch the video from here and see for yourself. Uh, people rarely take time to deeply re uh, reflect on the uniquely important fact that our species came within hair's breadth of a total annihilation during the Cuban Missile Crisis. We learned long after it was all over that the only reason a nuclear, a nuclear armed Soviet submarine didn't discharge its payload on the U.S. Navy and set off a full scale nuclear exchange between the U.S. and USSR because one of the three men in the sub needed to authorize the weapons used stood again against the other two 
and refused. That man was Velasi Archipal, and he's responsible for the fact that you and everyone you love exists today. There's a good PBS documentary about the event on YouTube if you're curious. Pre-existing agendas, President Kennedy was constantly going back and forth in the communication with the Soviets during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and any and any number of things could have gone calisimically cal cal wrong during that exchange, and Kennedy had not made certain concessions at certain times, and no, went to hold back instead of pressing forward. He made a series of diplomatic moves, and he would, and that would not be possible in this current paranoid, leak-prone climate, including secret recalling USA's uh, Jupiter missiles from their position in Turkey at Khrushchev's request. From all um, the outrage that liberals display whenever a high-profile Republican utters the phrase deep state, it sure is interesting that the commander-in-chief has found himself in a situation where he is at the whim of a collective of warmongers who are advancing a pre-existing agenda against a nation they perceive as a geostrategic geostrategic threat to U.S. hegemony. It begs the question, who is really in charge? The war machine, the U.S. war machine is the most powerful military force in the history of civilization, and the alliance of nations that upholds it functionally the most powerful empire that the world has ever seen, because so much power depends on the behavior of this gargantuan war engine. It is seen by those with real power as too important to be left to the will of the electorate and too, and too important to be left to the will of the elected commander-in-chief. This is why Americans are the most propagandized people in the world. This is why Russia hysteria have been blasted into the psyches for three years. And this is why we are all at an ever-increasing risk of dying in a nuclear holocaust. And here's an update. Trump now seems like he might be denying that was the uh, New York Times sources that said it's happening, it's happening. It's unlikely that the Times would fabricate a story whole cloth. So if Trump is in fact denying the story that it, either the sources are lying about what they are doing in their own purported jobs or Trump is still being kept in the dark or Trump is just lying. Do you believe that the falling New York Times just did a story state that the United States has especially increased the cyber attacks on Russia, Trump tweeted? This is a virtual act of treason by a once one great paper. So desperate for a story. Any story, even if bad for our country, also not true. Anything goes with our corrupt news media today. They will do or say whatever it takes with not even the slightest thought of consequence. These are true cowards without and without a doubt, without doubt, enemy of the people. Curiouser and curiouser. Well, well, well. So, as well as things we have to like observe and look and think about. Is he in the dark? Or has just been a rhetorical deception? Well, we all know too. That a lot of these neocons around him, you gotta always have to say, hey, it doesn't make any sense. But the fact is this the military industrial complex wanna attack countries for personal benefits, their own gain, no one else's. Well, we just gotta observe responsibly and be vigilant regardless. Many of us know, too, he is a, uh, could be a patsy if anything happens. So, all we got, all we got to say is read the fine print, examine things responsibly, and make your own judgment. But be prepared at all costs. All right, I'm going to do one more here. Pretty mellowed out. And this, and this one here came from MikeMeharry.com. And it came out today. This here, I used to believe. Nice little commentary. I used to believe the Republican Party was a party of fiscal responsibility and limited government. Well, the fiscally Republican administration currently running things in Washington, D.C. just ran up the biggest 
May budget deficit in history. Last month, the deficit came at $208 billion, according to the Department, Treasury Department data. There's a link for that. You can read it for yourselves. Interestingly, the media fixates on the Trump tax cuts and blames them for the deficit. But revenues are actually slightly up slightly, mostly due to income generated by the tariffs. The big problem is the spending. Uncle Sam spent $440 billion last month, up 21% year on year. And the first time in U.S. history, the federal government spent more than $3 trillion in the first eight months of the fiscal year, spending 9.3% on the year so far. So, the tax reform is great, but what we really need is government reform. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get that from the GOP, despite all the rhetoric. The Republicans spent like drunken sailors, just like the Democrats do. No offense intended to be to any drunken sailors out there. They show no inclination to address the spending problem. Here, what's really should is what what really should concern you. The government is running up budget deficits like we're in the middle of a deep recession. The only other time in history that the federal government has run deficits this high was during the four-year 2009 to 2012, when the Obama administration boosted spending grapple with the 2008 financial crisis. But supposedly, the economy is booming. We should be seeing shrinking deficits. If the government is running up debt like this now, what's going to look like when the next recession hits? I don't think that day is very far away. So when people tell you that the Republican Party is a party of limited government and fiscal responsibility, tell them that they're full of crap. Republicans are no more limited government than the Democrats are anti-war. Oh, I do believe in spending cuts, my friends. That should be the big key. Even every state in the union could put a freeze on that money to the federal government. Could go, hey, no more, no more um, spending sprees. It's getting ridiculous. The debt should be a lot lower, not higher. We all know too about fiat money is no value. So how is that legit? One of the great quotes says here for the week. Necessity is a plea for every infringement of human freedom. It is the argument of tyrants. It is the creed of slaves. William Pitt. Fiscal responsibility is essential. And I have to agree with it completely. So Mike Meharry is correct. Regardless of party, you never trust this particular institution at all. That is it. I want to thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share us throughout the social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, and you said something interesting I want to check out, whatever you do, please send your correspondence to the quorum. Furthermore, I'll be leaving all my footnotes, including social media sites, email addresses, to contact me. And that is it. Once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance, health for the soul, and can liberty humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves, keep on spreading love, and may guardian spirits be with you.